Why are most free-to-play games becoming pay-to-win? Free-to-play games. Free-to-play titles. Free-to-play. Pay-to-win. Paying to win in a video game. It's a pay-to-win model. Games didn't used to be this way. Back in the good old days, there were no loot boxes, battle passes, or microtransactions. Something changed though, and game companies switched from play to win to pay to win. The socially accepted way of behaving in your game should be paying. But what's interesting is that in the beginning, almost every video game was pay to win. Back in the 70s and early 80s, you were most likely to find gamers at an arcade surrounded by the aroma of heated circuitry and musty carpet. And for those that can't imagine the smell or weren't around for the arcade days, games were different back then. You had to pay to play, but you also had to keep paying if you weren't good. You see, back then, most arcade games used a life system, like Space Invaders, Pac-Man, or Time Crisis. And these games had only one goal, keep customers paying. They wanted people to fail, because this was how arcades made back their money on cabinets that could cost up to 10 grand. This is also why you'd see 30 people craning their neck to watch one guy for hours. Dumping quarter after quarter every few minutes as a teenager was pricey. But with the rise of home gaming in the 80s and 90s, arcades started dying off. Why spend all your lunch money trying to beat Ninja Turtles when you could buy the game once and play it as much as you want? So with the demise of arcades, the pay-to-win model went into hiding, at least for a little while. What's crazy though, is that the pay-to-win model would take almost 20 years to reappear, needing free-to-play games, piracy, and League of Legends for it to come back bigger and badder than ever. What's even more crazy is that it all started with Doom. There had never been something quite like Doom. It was massive and it changed video games forever. Doom had top of the line 3D graphics, there was a PC multiplayer, it supported mods, but most importantly, the game was free to play. You have to understand, this was insane to do back then. You didn't have free to play games. Remember, everything was physical. You purchased games on floppy disks or cartridges. Digital games weren't a thing. So free to play games weren't free to distribute, meaning id Software had to buy millions of floppy disks, then print Doom on millions of disks, then ship these disks around the world, spending hundreds of thousands before ever making a dime. So why would they do this? Well, back then developers were not the ones who made the most money off their games. Most of the money went to the publishers and developers often got single digit percentages and royalties. It didn't want to go this route. So they decided to try the free to play model known as shareware at the time. Using it before he pays for it. Mm -hmm. That's the wonderful thing about oh, shareware. Okay. Yeah. He actually has it in his hands and he sees if it's fit for his purpose and if it isn't, he doesn't have to use it and doesn't have to pay for it. The goal was to get Doom in the hands of as many players as possible and hope they could upsell. A high risk, high reward strategy. For those confused on how shareware works, think of it like a phone game. Players only get access to the first few levels with the rest of the game being restricted behind a paywall. The goal is to get people hooked. And if they wanna play the rest of the game, they need to call and pay for a code that unlocks the rest. A little more convoluted than just adding your credit card. But the beauty of this model was that it would get 100% of the revenue instead of splitting it with the publisher. It worked. <laughs> Doom became a phenomenon. Companies were banning Doom from their networks because land games were clogging them up and slowing things down. I mean, the game had been installed on more computers worldwide than Microsoft's then new operating system, Windows 95. So because of the free-to-play model, it was able to upsell millions of copies, make tens of millions of dollars, and completely change the world of video games. However, it isn't among the modern gaming industry's juggernauts. Why isn't the company still revolutionary? And why aren't people complaining about them like they do EA, Activision, and Ubisoft? There are a few reasons, such as the founding team breaking up or creating some disappointing sequels. However, the main reason is that id got comfortable. They were years ahead of their time with the free-to-play model, but they ignored the main reason for Doom's global success and released their following game, Doom 2, for $40 a piece. They completely forgot the power of the free-to-play model, and as a result, they stopped making free-to-play games. Slowly, the company fell apart. So with the failure of id, the free-to-play model amongst major studios would disappear in the West, at least until the rise of League of Legends 16 years later. But in the meantime, new innovators would eventually find success, and it's all thanks to piracy. Why should I sail with any of you? Four of you have tried to kill me in the past. One of you succeeded. The game piracy was a huge problem in the 80s and 90s, especially in Asia. Unlike most Western countries in Japan, many Asian countries didn't have piracy laws. There was nothing enforcing that $250,000 warning every time they popped in a VHS. So at the time, 90% of all software and digital entertainment was pirated. Which means if you were a game developer and you had a million people playing your game in certain parts of Asia, it was likely that 900,000 of them didn't pay for it. Not a great way to make money. But there were many reasons for this. 
cost of living differs greatly between countries. I mean, imagine paying 50 US dollars for a video game when your monthly salary is 200 bucks. So Western publishers did try selling games with prices that reflected the local cost of living, but pirates would just travel to those countries, buy copies in bulk for huge discounts, and then sell these games in the States. And as I'm writing this, I remember going to a swap meet in 2005 and seeing Star Wars Battlefront, the first one, for like 20 bucks right after it came out. It was in a janky looking case, but I didn't care. The game was half the price that it was at GameStop. And I'm just realizing that it was probably purchased somewhere in Asia and shipped to that dinky swap meet for people like me to purchase. So we can see that the rampant piracy in Asia and the rise of the internet, up and coming Asian publishers really needed to innovate to succeed. And the first company to do it was Nexon. Unsurprisingly, Nexon was a Korean company, one of the countries most affected by piracy, and they released the first digital free-to-play game called Quiz Quiz in 1999. This MMO set off a chain reaction, setting in motion a wave of Asian free-to-play games. Nexon had finally figured out how to monetize video games in Asia, and they didn't stop there. Nexon went on to create MapleStory, the first pay-to-win game in 2003, which was also the first game to feature loot boxes inspired by the real-life gachapon toy dispensers. But while many Asian studios were innovating, the West continued as if nothing had changed, selling physical games in retail stores. Because if it's not broke, don't fix it. But it was broken. The West may not have had as much rampant piracy as Asia, but I remember the good old days of Pirate Bay and LimeWire. You'd have a dedicated computer for all your games, music, and viruses. So the US still had piracy, enough that the music industry was actually failing in the 2000s because of it. That said, piracy wasn't the only problem with the Western status quo. You see, the industry was growing, and companies wanted more people playing their games. But $50 price tags were keeping a lot of people out of the gaming market. So the other problem was price elasticity of demand. What the hell is even that? Basically, it's a way to measure demand for a game. So if the price of a game is $50, you can see only half the people who want to play a game will buy it. If the price goes down, the player base will go up. So if you give your game away for free, you maximize your player base. But if you give your game away for free, then you need to make money elsewhere. And Western studios just couldn't wrap their mind around this concept yet. Executives would sweat anytime they ever heard free to play. And in business, we call this an innovator's dilemma. This is where League of Legends comes in. Asia was popping out free games left and right, and the companies making them were raking in the cash. Riot's founders, Brandon Beck and Mark Merrill, the creators of League of Legends, saw the free to play model working in Asia and came up with a genius plan. They decided to create an optimized version of Dota, which at the time was a Warcraft 3 custom game with a massive player base, me included. They knew people loved the game, even though it was a janky experience. First, you had to purchase Warcraft 3, then you had to go to custom games and try to find a lobby featuring the Dota mod. Then when you finally found one, you could run to Taco Bell and back before the game even loaded. So Riot's founders knew they had a great gameplay loop they could optimize, but they also knew that League needed to be free to play. The founders took this idea of free to play Dota and with just a wireframe and a pitch, went to investors. Some were confused, thinking players would never spend money on cosmetic purchases. Others, however, were blown away. Mitch Lasky, one of the first investors in Riot, put it this way. And they understood not only the free-to-play concept, but they understood how to bring an audience to the table to prime the pump of free-to-play. So these investors didn't throw millions at Riot because the game looked good, but because Riot proved they knew how to make free-to-play work. Which is why League of Legends is one of the most pivotal games in history, for better or worse. So with League's success and the introduction of free to play in the West, pay to win was right around the corner. Champions can fall, gods can bleed, where were you when the West rose up to conquer champions? One of my favorite experiences with pay to win happened a few years ago. I was visiting Yosemite when I overheard an elderly woman pleading with her husband to give her $3. I guess she had been struggling to beat a Candy Crush level and needed to buy some gold bars to help her win. He muttered something under his breath, but he handed her his credit card. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This 70 year old woman was being manipulated by Candy Crush and based off the interaction with her husband, it wasn't the first time. In that moment, I realized that anybody could be swindled by pay to win mechanics. I mean, Candy Crush at its peak was pulling in one to $3 million a day with in-app purchases. That's almost a billion dollars a year. 
This is what happens when you have companies that can manipulate you so well, you don't even notice when it's happening. And the worst part, they're teaching others their tricks. Some of you will probably uh, be slightly shocked by all the tricks I have listed here, but I'll leave the morality of it out of the talk. You know it's gonna be a gnarly presentation when the guy starts with, let's not think about the morality of this. And he doesn't. This presentation on how to monetize free-to-play games really outlines everything. In-depth industry secrets on how to use psychology to trick people to spend money. The whole time watching this, all I could think of was the old adage of the frog in the pot. If you put a frog in the pot of boiling water, it'll jump out. But put the frog in cool water and gradually heat it up, the frog will boil to death. Whereas the presenter puts it, you hook the gamer first with something irresistible, then you create a habit with an easy and rewarding gameplay loop, then pounce when the game becomes a hobby because players will do anything to win or progress. It's crazy to outright hear it, but it gets even better. Top grossing games have in-game economies worth tens of thousands. Meaning the more players can spend on a game, the more you'll make. Make stuff immediately useful, immediate gratification. So you don't want them thinking about the purchase. People are much more attached to the stuff they have than an equal amount of things that they can gain. We are more likely to pay if you threaten to take something away. So this is, we are herd animals, we tend to do what all, all of the others do. Absolutely do not want to tell them that the majority of people in your game never spend money. That's poison. Never tell them that. And my favorite of all, Make sure that your games aren't too skill-based. The craziest part about all of this is that what he's talking about isn't even the worst of it. It's terrible that game studios have taken these strategies and turned most free-to-play games into pay-to-win. But somehow, pay-to-win has also infected full-priced games too. You're not only having to pay to play, but they want you to keep paying. Sound familiar? We seem to have come full circle. We are somehow back in the arcade days where I'm more likely to just watch someone else play because it's too expensive for me to keep up. And I know that you know who really took this pay to win model to a new level. The two time worst company, EA. EA saw all these free to play games using pay to win strategies and thought we could do better. At first glance, it didn't seem like a big deal. Like the cosmetics in Maple Story, who cares if someone wants to pay for a purely visual change? But over the years, loot boxes went from simple game additions to full on progression systems. It was finally perfect in the eyes of EA. They were following the advice of the very moral presenter when he says, The reason I highlighted convenience over up there or, or progress is that most of your sales will be here. Uh, customization hats and stuff, they're nice, but you, you'll have a single digit percentage of your income coming from that. You make the real money monetizing progression systems not cosmetics. So EA shipped this new model with their brand new game, Star Wars Battlefront 2. 12 years after I purchased the first Battlefront game out of Swap Me, I found myself reading article after article about Battlefront 2. Everyone's conclusion? The game was pay to win. People lost their minds. You get four f planets! Controversies just won't stop coming. I would recommend not buying this game just because of the anti-consumer practices. EA tried to save face, but the backlash was immense, so EA backed down. Loot box were grabbing the attention of governments. Was pay to win leaving AAA games? Were we finally free? Come! Smiggles free! Nope! Although we won against EA and loot boxes are disappearing, all sorts of games continue to hide pay to win mechanics in their games. So pay to win isn't going anywhere. Unless governments step in or studios find a more lucrative solution. Which brings me to my final piece. We need an ethical and lucrative solution to get rid of pay to win. Just like before with the introduction of the free to play model, game studios are stuck and they do not know how to overcome it. With inflation rising and costs soaring, studios need to make more money on their games now more than ever before. But they know if they raise the price of their games, they'll cut off large chunks of their player base, which is why it took so long to see games rise above $60. But these game companies should also know if they keep going down this road of pay to win, they'll destroy their brand and future sales. Short-term thinking is hindering their potential. The hybrid model trend and the excess of manipulative monetization strategies can't last forever. Gamers are starting to wise up. So these companies are in a pickle. They need to think long-term, but don't know how. This is where true innovators shine. 
When you're in that pickle, you are forced to find creative solutions to unique problems. Those that don't will die or be bought by those that do. This is why League of Legends was so successful and why I'm so bullish on indie studios. When you're small, you have to innovate to succeed. And whoever creates a great game that doesn't limit a game's value like pay to win, but adds value in a unique way will become like Doom in the 90s or League of Legends in the 2000s. A beloved game that changes the entire industry. As part of our tradition, we like to feature indie games at the end of our videos. And this time, our community chose the timeless free-to-play gem, Cave Story. Despite being released 19 years ago, Cave Story remains a pinnacle example of indie game development and has forever altered the perception of where exceptional games can originate from. We couldn't think of a more fitting choice to feature. You can play the game for free on PC or pick up a copy of the game on the Switch. I highly suggest it. And if you want to get your game or one of your favorite indie games highlighted in our next video, come join our Discord and let us know what game we should feature next.